Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as we get into the word of God, I want you to be expectant. But before we begin, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you. Yes, Lord. We we are grateful for your word. Yes, Lord. We are humbled at the spirit of revelation. Yes, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you, Father. That you left us not in the dark, but you gave us the word of God by which to live by in this world. Yes, Lord. We yield ourselves to the leading of the Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord. Let Christ be magnified and exalted. Yes, Lord. Let every voice that is contrary to the knowledge of God be silenced in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our text today will be taken from the book of Revelation chapter 20 and we will be reading from verse 4 to verse 6. Let's open there and let's read. This is what the Bible says. John is getting another account to us. It says, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received this mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. Blessed be the word of God. A very interesting three verses that we have. Because they talk about the millennial reign of Christ. Last week I told you that the word millennium comes from two Latin words that are added together. The first word is mil, which means a thousand. And the second word is the word anam, which means years. So joining the two, you have the word millennium. And in the context of the Bible that we are looking at, it refers to the a thousand year reign of Christ. Last week, we realized or we saw that this reign will be a physical reign. And that sides with what we call the premillennials. 
echo chogera ne bali abo abakiriza nta jja kufuga wano kunsi but again this is not all they, like I told you, this is the battleground for Christian theology. There are those in agreement of certain things. There are so much, there's so much disagreement about so many things that happen. There are some questions that are being asked. And some of the answers we will provide. Key of among this, the questions that are being asked concerning the millennial reign of Christ. Is the question of who are they that will reign with Christ for their thousand years? Then what will happen to the rest? Now this is what today's text will cover. The passage itself is split into three groups. And we'll look at the three groups one by one. First of all, John sees thrones. Now, when you look at a throne, that means somebody is reigning. Thrones speak to rulership. But also thrones speak to judgment. And the Bible says those who were seated on the throne. In other words, these are rulers. The Bible says are those who have been given authority to judge. So it, here you have the understanding. One, they are rulers. To them is given the authority to judge. Who are these that have been given the authority to judge? Now we are not going to speculate because scripture is very clear and we will allow scripture to interpret scripture. L the first interpretation that comes to us is found in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Here Jesus was teaching. And let's look at what the scripture says. Jesus says, Assuredly I say unto you that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Here Jesus is speaking to the apostles. And I let's not mistaken the two. This judgment is to the twelve tribes of Israel. Praise be to God. Then the second text we'll look at is found in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 26. When Jesus speaks to the church, this is the promise he makes to the people that are being persecuted. The people that are being murdered for the word. He makes this promise. Chapter 2 and verse 26. He says, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. To him that overcomes. In other words, you cannot overcome until you have faced adversity. 
tosobola kuwangula paka ngo yise mkuwakanyizibwa nentalo overcoming is a result of facing conflict and being able to come out on top obwangu zikuva mukusoka kubaka ebintu byoita me bikuwakanya paka wobiyinza no jango likunti this is a conditional promise Jesus says one you have to overcome. Secondly, in the overcoming, you have to keep his works. There has to be a diligence on duty. You have to fulfill the assignment for which you were presented on this earth. And you don't do it halfway. You don't do it only in the good times. You do it in spite of the circumstances and the conditions that you live in. And you execute this work until the end. So while there is still some breath in you, in spite of what is around you, you keep on doing what God has called you to do. It is these ones, Jesus says, that will be given power over nations. The word power is the word exousia, which means authority to rule over nations. Now we saw in the text that these were seated on thrones and to them it was given the authority to judge. So the first group is with respect to the 12 apostles who will be given authority to rule over Israel. Now, the overcomers of the present age, those are the ones that will rule over nations. So, it is this second category actually that Paul talks about in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. Look at what he says. He says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So when he is talking about judging, he is talking about seated, being given that authority to execute judgment. So this includes the matters of the tribulation. Those who have been beheaded, those who have been executed for the cause of Christ, who bore testimony, who refused to take the mark of the beast on their head, or on their hand. Now, this may be literal, but it may also be symbolic. Because the head has got to do with the mind. It has got to do with the way you visualize. It has got to be to do with the way the mind works or the heart works. And the hand has got to be to do with execution. So the way you work, the way you do what you do, points to the mark on the hand. And the thought process, the heart process then points the head. So symbolically, this also speaks to the thought, it speaks to the mind, it speaks to the will, it speaks to the actions that we do. 
So it is this group that we see in Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 7. Those that we are told that were put to death, that will live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. You see, that's why Christians, we don't weep like as those who don't have hope. Why? Because it is not the end. We have a life to live even after this life. We speak resonating to what Job said that I know that my Redeemer liveth. There is something we know which the world does not know. Which every, not everybody knows. You see, we know a lot of things in life. We know our job, uh, the nature of our jobs and how to execute them. You know your family members. <laughs> but we, we know so much much about our lives. But there are certain things that need to be known. Things concerning redemption. Things concerning life. And here Job says, I know that my Redeemer Lives. Personal, my. It's not corporate, it is personal. And he says, I know that he lives. So, do you know the Redeemer? Or let me put it this way do you have a Redeemer? You see, many times when we are in Positions of distress, we look to government as our redeemer. But governments come and go. Government is We look to people in family. But people come and people go. All those are limited. But there is one who is not limited. His name is Jesus. That even when you die in this life, even when life is cut short on this side of time, on the other side of time, you will live and you will reign with him. It's amazing. That when these people were executed, the Antichrist will think that he has robbed them of life. Yet when he's incarcerated for a thousand years, remember he's living. So he is aware of what is happening. Then those that he executed are reigning in the place where he was reigning before for the short time. And they are going to reign for a thousand years. Imagine. The reverse of roles. They have the freedom to execute what you fail to execute, which is judgment. They are now in a position of power. Seated on thrones. They can't be overpowered. They can't be overtaken. And you who robbed them of this life is now incarcerated for the period that they are in. What an amazing God that we serve. Scripture is so alive. It says, these will reign. So they are only mentioned here as the group that reigns with Christ for a thousand years in verse 4. But there is another group 
ne walu echi binje echi dala the group which is not reigning with christ echo chute chifugira wa mune kristo and they have died ngate bafa so what happens to the rest of the day this is what verse 5 says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended you see it's, it's not socialism nah, no god is selective he takes those whose lives were taken from them he raises them up to life and he causes them to reign then the rest those who did not receive Christ though they were in charge though they thought they had everything why these are raining katibanonga bali bali kufuga these are dead bali basigala yo mubafu their bodies are not resurrected to life emibiri jabwe te jazu kizibwo kuva mubafu and for a thousand years banga lya myaka 10 and they will appear we will see later at the great white throne of God's judgment. Kati mutujabala beli mu mase mu namulonde nkule enjere ya katonda ngasale misango. For them to be judged and then taken to the lake of fire. Ngabo bajja kusali bwe misango bamale basuli bwe mu nyanje yo muri. The text concludes. Echawa ndikibwa chiunzika. That this is the first resurrection. Tikuno ko kuzukiro ku olubeli ebeli. And adds that blessed and holy is he that is part of the first resurrection and, and over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests to god and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years several nuggets to get here one, we will have more than one resurrection. So we have this one and we have another yet to come. So the second one is the one that is associated with the white throne. The second nugget we have here is the nugget that there will be more than one death. So even this death is not the first one. If you are not in Christ, you see, these ones that died and are raised in the first resurrection, the Bible states that the second death will not have power over them. But it will have power over those who did not experience the first resurrection. So it is so tragic to die without Christ because what you experience that we see is the first death but there is going to be even a second one so this is the first separation from life for those on this side of time then there is another separation which is eternal and we'll look at that as we go ahead in scripture the bible says that these who are resurrected with christ in the first resurrection are the ones that are going to reign with him why because christ has first risen 
And Paul writing about this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. From verse 20 to verse 23. Has something very interesting to say. Let's look at what the scripture says. It says, but now. Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, which speaks of Adam, also by man, came the resurrection of the dead. Let's pause one moment here. Paul is saying that by one man death came to us. Then by one man also talking about Jesus Christ. Those who had died have now been resurrected. You see, and it has two symbolisms here. First of all, before we believe in Jesus Christ, we are dead in our sins. Spiritually, we are dead. So when we embrace Christ, when we believe on the message of the cross, and the resurrection from the dead, and Jesus as the giver of life, he gives us that life. Then what in essence happens is that spiritually we become alive. So life comes to the dead. And the dead is resurrected. So that's why when you live this life, your spirit doesn't die. It is not separated from God because the life of God lives in you. Your life is hid in Christ. In God. And that's amazing. Because life becomes a part of you. The life of God flows through you. Now, the mind is being renewed to conform to this. And the body will die. But the body will then be resurrected. The same way the spirit was resurrected. Now, what happens is now the resurrected body and the resurrected spirit are joined together. And the new you now reigns with Christ. Amazing. This is what Paul is talking about. He says, For as in Adam all die, so all of us are dead. If you don't have Christ, you are dead. Why are you dead? Because all of us in Adam die. And say, even so in Christ, Kana, all are made alive. Katinga Adam wetuafa, katimu Christo nafene tufuli wabalamu. So in Christ we become alive. Katabali mu Christo tufu kabalamu. Without Christ we are still dead. Awatali Christo tusigala bafu. And he goes and says, Na but each one in his own order. Na yebuli omu mchigera chi. In other words, there is an order or process to follow. So the first one, Asoka. the Bible says Christ the first fruit. So Christ first. Christo. 
And the scripture says, and afterwards, listen to this, those who are Christ's at his coming. So when he comes, then those who are dead but are in Christ are then raised. Hallelujah. And that is why Christ becomes the first fruit. Can we dwell a little on this issue of the first fruit? Because when we talk about the first fruit, many people, what comes to mind is an offering. But let's dwell on the first fruit. What was the first fruit? This was a f- a s- the first fruit was a feast that was given to the Jewish nation. Let's not forget that. So the first fruit was not an offering. The first fruit was a feast. So this feast happened at the beginning of their grain harvest. So it usually happened in the month of Nisan. And so this was around the 16th of the 16th day of that month. Which also happened to be the third day of the Passover. And the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, so the first fruit was the time of giving thanks to God for his provision. So what would happen? A whole institution was put around this first fruit. Leviticus chapter 23 from verse Verse four, 9 to 14. Here we see the offering introduced in the feast. And the Bible says the people were to bring a sheaf of grain. And this would be given to the priest. And the priest would wave it before the Lord. Now, in addition to this, you had a burnt offering, a meal offering, and a drink offering, all put together at the same time. And Deuteronomy 26 from verse 1 to verse 10 gives us the details of how this feast was conducted. So, before the first fruit, you are not allowed to harvest anything. So, until the first fruit was brought to God. So you went and harvested and brought this to the priest. Who would wave it? Why? Because this offering was a resemblance of Israel's journey from Egypt to the land of promise. So their deliverance from imprisonment from the land of servitude to the land where they would be free, the land flowing with milk and honey. So it was this feast that was also used to calculate the feast of weeks. Praise be to God. Now, in the New Testament, 
the first fruit all points to Jesus Christ. And symbolically seven times it is mentioned. So Paul, when he writes, he calls one Epanetus and his house, the household of Stephan as the first fruit of Achaia. We see that in Romans chapter 16. And First uh, Corinthians chapter 16 as well. So why does he call them the first fruit? You see, just as the first fruit offering was the first portion of the larger harvest. So these were the first converts in the region. So when Jesus is called the first fruit from the dead, it means that he's the first of his kind and there will be others following. So Praise be to God. That's why the first sheaf was set up before God. Uh, James, when he writes, he calls believers a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Praise be to God. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. I want us to read this because this is where it points to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Basically, what he's saying is that Jesus' resurrection is what paved the way for the resurrection of others. The assurance that you and I have concerning the resurrection is the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. So this is an occasion of giving thanks to God for the resurrection. I need to point out also that concerning New Testament believers, first fruit is never directly mentioned in relation to giving. However, Paul taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2 that on the first day of the week we are to set aside an offering which is to be presented to God. You see, and so just as the first fruit was an offering as an occasion of thanksgiving. So we as Christians also give thanks. But I need to point out, it is not what we give. It is the heart that is the issue. Or let me put it this way. The value of the gift is determined by the heart. So the, the value of the gift is determined by the pos position of the heart. Or let me say the disposition of the heart. That's why the Bible says that God loves 
a cheerful giver. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, but I love the Amplified Version which says that whose heart is in is giving. So your heart should be involved in your giving. Because it is the disposition of the heart that gives value to the gift. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So the Bible says that the resurrection of the dead in verse 23 will be each in his own order. So the first resurrection reaches back to the re include the resurrection of Christ. And those then later who follow him. So Christ then becomes the chief of the first fruit. Which was offered in the first installment. So the first resurrection touches Christ, the believers in Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. With Christ having gone before them being the first fruit or the guarantee that this resurrection will happen. So now they are raised in the picture of Christ never to die with power over death. Christ, Jesus Christ being the first fruit, having gone before us and showed us that it is possible. And it will happen. Then those who believe in him, then when they die, will be raised from the dead, never to die again. Praise be to God. Now let's look at what Christ says concerning this. In John chapter 5, this is how he paints it, verse 28 20 to 29. He says, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all those who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of the dead. Praise be to God. Look at what he's saying here. Number one, the dead here. But there is this particular voice that they will hear and those that have believed in Christ. Now, I must say that this does not say that all this is happening at the same time. There is an order. According to verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so the ones that come first are those that have believed in Christ. And the Bible says that they, when they hear his voice, will come forth. Listen to that. Hallelujah. Jesus is amazing. His voice has the ability to bring up all the dead to life. A voice 
from him causes all the dead throughout time that have believed on him to come to life. It's not even a trumpet, it's not anything, it's his voice. Why? Because his voice is life. He is life. So when he speaks to the dead, in that time the Bible says, all that will hear will come to life. And they come to the resurrection of life. They are being made alive to live forever. Their resurrected bodies will live forever and ever. The Bible calls it the resurrection of life. And then it talks about the resurrection of condemnation. So even the other ones will hear his voice. They will come forth to go to condemnation. These ones will hear his voice. Come forth to live. These ones, on the other hand, will hear his voice. Come forth to a resurrection. In others, they will not die anymore. They will not go back to that state. They are now going to condemnation. Which leads to the second death. And that is very important for you to understand. Because here the Bible says there will be two resurrections. The question I need to ask which one will you be a part of? The good news is if you can still hear my voice now you can still make a decision to live for Christ to live according to what God has designed for your life that when his voice is heard after you leave this earth. You will resurrect to life and not resurrect to condemnation. So how does one resurrect to life? By surrendering your life to Jesus today. You believe with your heart. Confess with your mouth. Righteousness is given to you. And you are wonderfully saved. Why don't you say this prayer? Invite Jesus in your life to change it for eternity so that at the resurrection you will rise again to life. Pray with me. Please, say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you because you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin. He alone is the resurrection and the life. He died for my sins and was raised from the dead. Love Jesus, I believe you today. I ask you to come into my life. Every part of my life. Take charge, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me live for you from this day forward. That at the end of my time on earth, I will experience that first resurrection tonight and live and reign with you for all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for writing my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. If you have made that prayer sincerely from your heart, God has saved you. Please call that number on the screen. Somebody will receive it and give you the first instruction to life. It is an exciting time. Hallelujah. Now, somebody before I close has been confused about doing good. Jesus is talking about doing good and doing evil. It doesn't mean salvation is by works. Salvation is by faith. But that faith in Jesus Christ is what transforms your nature. And Jesus says, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And neither can a good tree bear bad fruit. So what it, what it begins with is the nature. So your nature has got to be transformed from bad to good. From sin to life. That is when you can do good that will bear fruit in eternity. I wish you take note of that. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for watching us. And from Dominion Church, we're saying God richly bless you. Until we meet again next week, we say shalom. May Jesus reign in your life. Yes, I forgive him. Amen. Amen.